2023 is upon us. It's a new year, a new opportunity to learn new things and try new things and explore new things. So let's all get ready for something new. Hey everybody, welcome back to the longest running series I've ever done on any platform, Reacteria! Today, we're going to take a look at this video from Answers in Genesis titled, This Drives Evolutionists Crazy, But It's True. This was actually just published a couple of days ago, but already several of you have sent it to me asking to respond to it. But I'll be honest though, as much as I would love to be driven crazy for a change, I'm not super confident that this video is going to do the trick. One of the last episodes of Reacteria was responding to Ken Ham, the head of this very organization, who said that he would drive us all crazy by simply just flatly denying that the age of the universe is what it is. I watched that whole video and all I got was bored. But maybe this video will be different. It's got an active comment section with lots of positive feedback. It's got an impressive view count for as long as it's been up. So let's take a look at it and see just how crazy we go today. Before I do, however, I've got to thank my patrons on Patreon for making this whole channel possible and the sponsor of today's video, Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that takes non-fiction books and breaks them down into bite-sized chunks so that you can understand the key points of the books in just 15 minutes. Now, I never want to encourage anybody to take the easy way out on education, so I actually tried Blinkist for a couple of weeks to see if I liked it before I made this video, and I was surprised by how well they were able to summarize so many arguments from so many different titles. I listened to several books that I had already read before, and a few that were new to me, and in both instances, I learned something new, and it made me want to go back and read the rest of the book to get more details. And there were even a couple of books that I quickly learned I had no interest in, so that saved me hours and hours of time that I can now invest in reading something that I actually like. And that's why I really like Blinkist. It doesn't replace reading books. It just exposes you to new ideas and allows you to learn new stuff in rapid time. And then you can decide what you want to dig into further. And with over 5,500 different titles to choose from, there is lots to explore. Plus, with their new Blinkist Connect feature, you can share your premium plan with another account at no additional cost. So you get two premium plans for the price of one. By opening the door to thousands of new ideas, Blinkist can help you be who you want to be in 2023. Me personally, I want to be an alligator juggler, but there aren't any good books on that yet. So head over to Blinkist.com slash Labs to start your seven-day free trial. If you like it, you'll get 25% off Blinkist Premium, plus two memberships for the price of one. Thanks so much to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. And with that, let's give Answers in Genesis one more chance to drive us crazy. For over 100 years now, naturalists have been pointing to the abundant evidence of evolution, to the West's population, in declaring that it's obviously visible to those who aren't so blinded by their doltish and foolhardy commitment to religious beliefs. Right? I mean, how can you not believe in evolution when natural selection can be observed? Right? And so aggressively has this notion been put forth in an effort to avoid the embarrassment of seemingly intellectually deficient, even many in the church have obediently smiled and nodded obeisance to this cloak of invisibility donned long ago by the story of evolution. The increase in belief in evolution that we're seeing amongst religious people is not because they don't want to seem stupid. It's because they're not stupid. Religious people are finally being exposed to the overwhelming and undeniable evidence for evolution at a rate that makes it difficult for organizations like this to withhold it from them anymore. So for the exact same reason that religious people believe anything about science, they are now starting to believe in evolution more and more. For example, just 400 years ago, Giordano Bruno argued that the sun was just another star, similar to all the others. He was imprisoned for years and ultimately burned at the stake by the church because that idea goes against the teachings of the Bible, which is exactly why Answers in Genesis still rejects it today. Another reason that Bruno was killed was because he said that the earth goes around the sun, not the other way around. That also goes against the teachings of the Bible, but Answers in Genesis has found a way to tweak their interpretation of the scripture to make that one make sense. Why? Because enough people understand that so they can't lie about it. The only reason why people understand these things about science is because education finally beat out indoctrination. We don't talk about
<laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. They do talk about Bruno. They call him a heretic and a mystic, and they say that it's honestly surprising that it took so long for the church to kill him, although they don't condone that. But does natural selection equal evolution? No, natural selection is the mechanism by which evolution works, in the same way that internal combustion is the mechanism by which a car works. But if I was talking about engines, I wouldn't have to clarify that I really actually mean cars or that I'm only talking about the engine. In the same way that if I was talking about natural selection, I really wouldn't have to say whether or not I meant evolution as a whole or just this mechanism, unless I'm like teaching a class, I guess then I would break it down. Why are you making this so difficult? You see, because natural selection is so equated with the story of evolution, and biblical creationists, of course, don't hold to the evolutionary story, many people are often surprised when they find out we actually believe in natural selection. Oh, that's why. You're doing the same thing that John and Jane do, where you say the mechanisms of evolution are real and the observable patterns of evolution are real, but that doesn't mean that evolution is real. That's because many people think natural selection is basically equivalent to molecules to man evolution. And this is likely due to the fact that natural selection can be scientifically demonstrated, leading many to believe evolution itself has been confirmed and therefore repeatedly fully validated scientifically. We don't believe that evolution has been fully validated scientifically because we're just confusing the words natural selection and evolution we know that evolution has been fully validated scientifically because of all of the ways that it's been fully validated scientifically. All jokes aside, it never fails to amaze me how organizations like Answers in Genesis can stare down the barrel of the mountains of evidence supporting evolution, admit that the mechanisms by which evolution functions are obviously verifiably true, live in a world where they benefit from medicine and agriculture and the whole field of biology, all of which hinges on our understanding of evolution, and still maintain that all of these scientists for hundreds of years were all all wrong because they were just confused about the definitions of a couple of words. That is a level of misplaced confidence that I hope I never understand. Now the namesake of the most popular version of evolution today, Charles Darwin, claimed observable evidence of evolution in the form of natural selection because of the variation he saw within certain kinds of animals. He saw many differences, such as the variation in beak size. Today, the ability for these small observable variations to occur in real time within a species is now often called microevolution by many. No, it's not. Variation occurring within a population is just called variation. Microevolution refers to small changes within the range of that variation. It's changes in the allele frequencies across multiple generations due to gene flow, genetic drift, and get this, natural selection. And this is where it starts to get a little tricky for the average person who often hears and understands conceptually that the generic meaning of evolution is change in living things over time. That is an incorrect definition of evolution and that has caused a lot of confusion. You're right. The actual definition of evolution is any change in the heritable characteristics of a population across multiple generations. It's the generations part that's important because evolution necessarily takes more than one lifetime. So when people don't understand that, they think that if they'll just keep watering their tomato plants, eventually they'll evolve to produce watermelons. But this is a very easy fix. It's something that I've addressed countless times both in this series and out in the real world. But that doesn't sound like what you're trying to say here. What it sounds like you're trying to say here is if you misunderstand evolution, then evolution makes no sense. And therefore, evolution makes no sense. And I'm waiting for you to say something different because that is the feel that I'm getting from this video thus far. You see, every biologist on the planet, whether creationist or evolutionist, believes creatures can change over time. So simply stating something has changed can't mean some kind of fish to philosopher definition of evolution if both camps, almost diametrically opposed in their beliefs, affirm creatures can change. You keep saying that living things can change, but you've yet to clarify how they change 
or how much they can change, or how long it takes them to change, or whether one generation or multiple generations change, or whether individuals or populations change. And these are all things that you need to be very, very, very clear about when talking about evolution, but especially when teaching about evolution. We're over a quarter of the way into the video, and if I were to stop it right now, I wouldn't know if he was talking about acclimatization, adaptation, or evolution. This dude has yet to successfully define the thing that he's trying to debunk. It's actually the type of change that both groups disagree on, and which kind observational science supports. Oh my glob, did he actually just say observational science? For context here, this is one of the biggest hairs that Answers in Genesis famously tries to split in order to try to muddy the waters of scientific knowledge enough to make themselves seem credible. They try to split science into two unequal camps, one of which being observational science, which deals with things that you can observe from start to finish, like the life cycle of a fly, and the other being historical science, which deals with things that you can't observe from start to finish, like the formation of a galaxy. And their argument is that because you can't observe the entire event in historical science, that means that your interpretation of the data is entirely based on your religious beliefs. And yes, of course, that could include evolutionism. So, for example, by their logic, if a creationist astronomer were to see a comet, they would automatically know that the comet must be less than 10,000 years old because the whole universe is less than 10,000 years old. Whereas, if an evolutionist astronomer were to see a comet, we must just assume that there's some endless supply of comets out there because the universe is billions of years old according to our religious beliefs. But of course, since this is all historical science, neither one of these competing theories is either testable or repeatable. And therefore, any attempts to understand the origins of this comet is an entirely faith-based endeavor. And no, none of that is a straw man or a hyperbole. That's all from their freaking website. So whenever this dude or anybody in Answers in Genesis talks about observational science, just remember that what they're actually saying is science that they can't BS their way out of, as opposed to the science that they try to drag down to their level to avoid having a serious conversation about it. You see, as Darwin observed the variations in various kinds of animals, he then extrapolated the observable variation he saw by claiming that perhaps given enough time, they could eventually become fundamentally new kinds of animals. But in order for that to have happened, one kind of creature, let's say a lizard-like animal, would have somehow needed to acquire brand new, never before existing genetic information for different forms, functions, and features like feathers, wings, or a different type of lung system, for instance, to turn it into a different kind, like a bird, for example. I feel like now is as good a time as any to remind everybody that kind is not a biological term. In biology, we group organisms based on their phylogenetics, or their evolutionary relationships to each other. And there are three main ways to do that, based on how we're doing the grouping and who we're including. First, there's a monophyletic group, which refers to a group of organisms and their common ancestor. So one whole branch on the tree of life. So birds, for example, are a monophyletic group. Then there's a paraphyletic group, which refers to a group of organisms and their common ancestor, but not all of the descendants of that ancestor. So for example, reptiles are a paraphyletic group because birds evolve from reptiles. So when we talk about reptiles as distinct from birds, we're talking about this group and their ancestor, but not all of the possible offspring. We're separating the two and talking about one whole branch of the family tree minus this chunk. And then there's a polyphyletic group, which refers to a group of organisms that share a common characteristic, but not a common ancestor that also has that characteristic. So for example, flying animals would be a polyphyletic group. It would refer to most birds, lots of insects, and a few mammals as well. But birds, insects, and mammals don't share a common ancestor that was able to fly. They each develop flight independently of one another. And so if we were to group them together into a polyphyletic group, it would be representing three distinctly different chunks of the tree of life. All of this jargon and the little differences can sometimes get a little bit confusing for some people. So if you want to simplify things, you could also use the word clade, which is synonymous with monophyletic group. There's the human clade and the turtle clade and the canine clade. Or you could use the word taxon. A taxon is pretty much any grouping on any part of the taxonomic hierarchy. So the way that we categorize life is domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Dangerous kangaroos punching children on family game shows.
and the word taxon could refer to any one of those levels of organizations. I could even say that such and such is true across multiple taxa, and that could be a characteristic that stretches across several species, or several orders, or even several phyla. Admittedly, I'm mainly saying all of this because I realized immediately after I released it that I should have put all of these details in the Light of Evolution episode 4, where I covered how to read an evolutionary tree, and I've been mad at myself about it ever since. But suffice it to say, for now and for this video, there are lots of ways that biologists group and classify life. Kind is not one of them. But the problem was that Darwin knew almost nothing of what we now know regarding modern genetics, and simply assumed that there was virtually no limit to the potential variation among the individuals of a species. Though truthfully, any animal breeder of his day could have told him otherwise, because people have been performing experimental breeding for thousands of years now. That selective breeding to bring about desired traits that you're talking about there, that's called artificial selection. And not only did Darwin know about artificial selection, he literally coined the term artificial selection. Also, fun fact, artificial selection is one of the most common ways to prove evolution by manipulating the allele frequency of a population through selective breeding in order to produce a variety of phenotypes. Like how we manipulated the wild mustard plant to produce broccoli and cauliflower and kale and kohlrabi and brussels sprouts. All of those very different phenotypes came about through simple mutation and human applied selection pressure. And so the general idea is, if humans can produce that much variation in such a short amount of time, imagine what can happen out in nature, where there's the whole world full of different ecosystems to choose from, and the vast expanses of Earth's history to work with. Which is exactly what Darwin wrote in On the Origin of Species. What are you talking about? Darwin's far-fetched beliefs in strange ideas like the possibility of a race of bears fishing in the water, perhaps slowly developing shorter legs, longer tails, then wider mouths, until they eventually evolved into whales, is the concept often called macroevolution today. Yeah, big surprise, that's not what Darwin said. He was talking about another scientist's observation of North American black bears swimming in the water with their mouths open, catching insects on the surface of the water and eating them. And he said that maybe if there were enough insects there, that the bears could get all of the nutrients that they needed from just eating those insects, that perhaps someday they could evolve to be more and more aquatic in their structure and habits until they were, quote, as monstrous as whales. So he wasn't saying that bears could literally evolve into whales, he was talking about convergent evolution. And he was kind of right, because while insect-eating bears didn't turn into whales, fish-eating artiodactyls did. And it makes for a good story. But like all fiction, it's completely unobservable outside of man-made depictions in textbooks and videos that are used to convince people of something no one has ever seen. Normally at this time, I would ask when this person observed the biblical creation that he believes in. But remember, Answers in Genesis already concedes that their position is entirely faith-based. They just want to convince you that so-called historical science is as well. So this person's argument isn't, I'm right and science is wrong. His argument is, I know I'm full of crap, but science is too. And for some reason, I find that even more obnoxious. Ironically, Darwin often used variation in kinds brought about by animal breeding as analogous to what natural selection might accomplish. Not even a minute ago, this guy said that Darwin didn't know anything about that. Just throwing that out there. However, while breeders use intelligence to select for desired traits such as size, strength, or physical appearance, the limits of what can be selected for are determined by the genetic variability already in existence within the creature, contrary to what Darwin imagined. Selection is a process dependent on what is available to be selected from, which is not limitless. The bottom line is, you can't select what's not there. So now here's the million dollar question. Where did the variation we see today come from? We agree that dogs have been selectively bred to bring about different traits. But when was the last time that you observed a wolf giving birth to a chihuahua? When was the last time that you observed the variation that we see in dogs occurring naturally? You haven't, because it doesn't happen. 
What did happen was that over a very long period of time, we looked at the natural variation of the dog population and we bred the smallest ones. And then we took the natural variation of that population and bred the smallest ones. And then we took the natural variation of that population and bred the smallest ones until eventually we got down to a chihuahua. That level of variation didn't exist in the original population. So how do you suppose that happened? How do you suppose new alleles that we don't see in nature came into existence just through selective breeding? How does that possibly make sense without mutation? Creating new alleles, new versions of the genes to produce new variation that we didn't see originally. That is how evolution works. Mutation creates variation. Natural selection acts on the variation. Mutation created variation in dogs. Artificial selection acted on that variation and produced phenotypes that were impossible in the original population. Detailed genetic analysis and knowledge of how DNA functions became a study many years after Darwin and revealed that all of the genes from a species compose a gene pool from which selection can occur in populations. The key to remember is that selection is limited to the genes in the gene pool of that particular kind. Genes that aren't in the gene pool of a kind can't be selected for. Again, mutation creates variation, which is then acted upon by natural selection. This video is admitting that two out of those three things is real and desperately trying to ignore the third thing and just hoping that you don't notice. 10 bucks says they don't bring up mutation until the very end of the video, and then they just quickly dismiss it as something that causes genetic disorders. Sometimes when I'm trying to communicate the big picture as to why natural selection isn't evolution, I like to use a simple explanation using a few decks of cards to illustrate. And although, like all analogies, it isn't completely accurate in every detail, it can still be effective in demonstrating some basic concepts. If we start with two decks, shuffling each and dealing half of the cards from one deck and half from the other deck into a new deck, we would see the new deck we created would be different from what the first ones were originally. But because there's a limited amount of cards to start with, they can only vary so much. And the big takeaway is this. No matter how long you deal these cards, Shuffling and dealing cards won't create new cards with brand new symbols that never existed before. And this is what natural selection does. It simply selects from what's already available. It doesn't add new, never-before-seen cards, so to speak. Of course it doesn't! That's what mutation is for! I've used the exact same playing cards analogy when talking about natural selection myself, but the big, obvious, glaring hole in that analogy that you glossed over by just saying that obviously the analogy can't cover everything, is that DNA has to be replicated before it's passed on. If you had to recreate that entire deck of cards every single time you wanted to deal it out, you would probably accidentally make one that was a little bit of a different shape, or maybe like like a seven of jacks or something that said two of hearts on the top and actually had three of clubs in the middle. And when you dealt those out, it would then fundamentally change the way that the game is played. Nobody's just scooping up everybody's genes and throwing them out to their kids, dude. Like we're 10 minutes into the video and this dude's whole thesis thus far has been two things that aren't the same thing aren't the same thing. And if you ignore a major part of evolution, then evolution doesn't work. Like, I agree, but it's still dumb. As Professor Walter Veith, former holder of the Chair of Zoology at the University of Western Cape said when discussing natural selection, the very name selection implies that you're choosing between two or more variants. Natural selection never increases the number of variants, it only decreases them. So how does a mechanism that makes less and less end up making more and more? Yeah, so obviously that makes no sense for all the reasons that we talked about before. But rather than continuing to dig into that, I want to draw your attention to something else. Dr. Veith is a PhD zoologist. 
He is also a creationist who abandoned science after being convinced that all the prophecies in the Bible were coming true. He is now a Seventh-day Adventist who left his job in academia after trying to teach creationism to his university students. And now he says that the belief in evolution is one of the root causes of racism. Now that all probably sounds fine for answers in Genesis, and you can see why they would quote him here. But Dr. Veith is not just a creationist zoologist. He is also a notorious conspiracy theorist who has given countless talks all over the world about his insane beliefs, many of which are freely available on YouTube, the rest of which he sells on his website. For example, Dr. Veith believes that the food that we choose to eat is the main cause of disease. He says that caffeine is a mutagenic nerve toxin that causes all sorts of horrible deformities, and that giving sports drinks to children causes uncontrollable aggression. He also says that the Freemasons secretly control all the governments of the world, that the Pope is the Antichrist, that Saddam Hussein died of cancer in 1999, and the man that we hung in 2006 was just one of his many body doubles, that Islam was created by the Roman Catholic Church in order to stamp out the last remnants of true Christianity, that men's domination over women is the natural order of things ordained by God, and that women in government is a sign of the apocalypse, that the CIA is behind 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombing, that climate change and the COVID vaccine are part of the Vatican's conspiracy to bring about the New World Order, and that the myth of the lost city of Atlantis is evidence in and of itself of a hyper-advanced civilization that existed before the Flood and conducted experiments to blend human and animal DNA. And despite all of those very strong stances, one question that he refuses to answer is whether the Earth is round or flat. He dodges that question every time. Oh, and by the way, he was also once investigated by the German government because he gave a lecture in Germany about how the Jesuits and the Freemasons conspired to create the state of Israel, during which he relativized the Holocaust and repeatedly quoted Benjamin Friedman, who is an outspoken Holocaust denier. I wonder if Answers in Genesis would be willing to endorse Dr. Veith's intellectual prowess in regards to any of those other ideas. After all, the quote that they used in their video is from 1999. That means he's been saying all of that other stuff for at least 22 years since he said that. And Answers in Genesis is a reputable organization. So it's not like they would just pick some random guy who happened to have a PhD and say something that they liked and put him on their massive platform without caring about the fact that he's freaking crazy. That would be grossly irresponsible. And believe me, there's a lot more to say about Walter Veith. Seriously, the deeper you dig, the worse it gets. But I just want to point out the fact that Answers in Genesis, citing that dude as a scientific authority and an example of a critical thinker who broke free from the norm and discovered the truth, is a monumental red flag. In the same way, if a various group of dogs, some with long, some with medium or short hair, migrated into an area that had a very cold climate, for example. Obviously, the long-haired dogs would likely survive better as they would be able to keep warmer than their shorter-haired counterparts. So, because this environment favors that specific genetic combination, those dogs will reproduce more effectively, i.e. their genetic deck is advantageous in this game of life under this environmental rule set. But remember, if we changed the environment, i.e. the rules, and had dropped the original group of dogs into a very warm environment, the climate would have selected for the dogs with more of the short-haired gene combinations. So natural selection isn't a truly creative process. It only selects from what God made in the first place in each kind. And now we're right back to this. The major driver of evolution is true, but evolution somehow isn't true. And that might seem innocuous enough. I mean, that description of natural selection was just fine. But the problem comes when you buy into their rhetoric, and then you have to deal with the implications of their dogma. You see, as I've said countless times before, even if you could completely disprove evolution in its entirety, you still wouldn't be one step closer to proving creationism. Because disproving one idea isn't the same as proving another. So all you would be able to do at that point is say, I have no explanation for biodiversity, and then start putting in the hard work to gather evidence for creationism. 
But Answers in Genesis doesn't get that. They see creationism and evolution as two competing religions. So they're not just saying that evolution isn't true, they're saying that creationism is true. And not only that, they know who the creator is. It's God. And not just any God, the God of the Bible. And not just any Bible, the version of the Bible that they're reading. And not just any reading of that version of the Bible, their interpretation of that version of the Bible. Out of all the possible creation myths, they have the correct understanding of the correct interpretation of the correct translation of the correct version of the correct one. And that allows them to disregard the scientific evidence that is true and understandable across time, space, culture, and language. And once you trap yourself in that kind of thinking, you're immediately forced to grapple with the fact that while yes, the Bible does mention creation, it also mentions lots of other things, like for example, unicorns. And now you need to find a way to make unicorns sound scientifically feasible by saying things like, well, rhinoceroses and narwhals exist, so it's not really that crazy that there might be a one-horned horse as well, and lots of other animals have gone extinct, so just because we don't see any unicorns around today, we shouldn't doubt their existence in the past. While also saying, of course, that if you can't observe something directly, then it's not observational science and we have no way to validate that it's real. And also, if we haven't found enough transitional fossils, then there's no reason to believe those species existed and we should disregard half of biology. And because this god can just whip up new species out of nothing with all the genetic variation they could ever possibly need, that means that the diversity we see within human populations today all could have been created in one single generation from one pair of middle brown people. And you can make a simple dihybrid cross like you learn how to do in freshman biology class to show that the 100,000 years of human diversification, which we have detailed genetic evidence for, all happened overnight. So while to the average viewer, this video might seem like a simple difference in vocabulary, and when you really look at the fine details, it's just not quite what you think. What they're actually doing here is baiting a massive trap to try to convince you to distort everything you know about biology and geology and physics and chemistry and astronomy, all to make room for this one single belief that they offer no evidence for besides, I read it in a book. Don't fall for it. To create truly new traits, mutations in the DNA would have had to happen that could somehow create, add, and integrate a huge amount of incredibly sophisticated information into the gene pool. Something that's never been observed. And now, in the last stretch of the video, we're finally talking about mutation. And you'll notice that the wording here is very, very specific. So that it seems like a slam dunk for all the people who don't realize that we have observed mutations that add tremendous amounts of information to the gene pool of several populations. And also, it avoids all accountability, because no matter which mutation I point to, this guy just has to say, it's not sophisticated enough information, and it didn't create a new kind. And if I go through every single detail, of punctuated equilibrium, and how adaptive radiation follows mass extinction, and how clearly rapid variation is dependent on the availability of niches, and how different selection pressures work, and how different patterns of selection work. All this guy has to do is say, you didn't observe that from start to finish, therefore it's not observational science, it's just your religious beliefs. It's like when a child invents a new game on the playground, and then constantly comes up with new rules that you didn't know about so that they can't lose. When you choose to start from the premise that one person's guess is just as valid as another person's evidence, you have sacrificed the ability to learn. Genetic mutation may sound creative when used in pop culture references where superheroes gain fantastic abilities. But in actuality, they are genetic copying mistakes caused by various factors that occur when DNA produces copies of itself, far from producing useful and novel genetic information. Mutations tend to break things. They degrade the existing genetic code already in place. And while you can achieve different looks such as normally red flowers being made pink, this is not actually the creation of a novel genetic feature from nothing. It's brought about by subtraction, not addition. 
First of all, saying that mutations degrade the genetic code is implying that DNA has some sort of perfect template state and that mutations are deviating away from that. That's not how that works. Second, mutations don't tend to break things. Again, this implies that mutations are generally harmful, which they're not. Most mutations are neutral, and out of the around 175 novel mutations per human generation, only about three of them on average are actually deleterious. Third, we do see beneficial mutations all the time, from bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics, to humans who produce lactase past the age of five so they can keep drinking milk for their whole lives. Wild almonds naturally produce a chemical called amygdalin, which breaks down into cyanide during digestion. Just a couple of handfuls is enough to kill somebody, but one single gene mutation made the domestic breed safe to eat, which is why they were one of the first domesticated trees. And what about the rock pocket mice that live across the American Southwest? This is a vast stretch of desert studded with patches of dark rock, and the mice that live in the dark rocky areas have each developed dark colorations to give them the camouflage they need to survive. And even though some of those patches are hundreds of miles apart, the mice have developed the same coloration through through completely different mutations on completely different genes. That's mutation producing new phenotypes that are acted on by natural selection to change the composition of the population to something that wasn't present in the original variation. Literally the exact thing that this video says could never happen, happening over and over and over again in several different ways that we can easily verify through genetic testing. And fourth, we do see mutations that create new phenotypic characteristics rather than just tinkering on what was already there all the time. From bacteria that evolved to eat human-made products like plastic and nylon, to Lenski's long-term evolution experiment showing new genetic variation and new metabolic functions evolving, to the evolution of single-celled organisms into multi-celled organisms, which is something that has been directly observed from start to finish in laboratory settings multiple times. All this dude has accomplished for the past 13 and a half minutes is conceding just a little bit of ground to science and then trying to plant the exact same flag of creationism in a new spot. It's the same tired, worn out, boring arguments that have been given again and again and again and again for decades and they are debunked the exact same way every single time. And just to prove that point, Here's an article called New Proteins Without God's Help, in which a biologist tears apart almost these exact same arguments that mutation can't create new things like a protein back in 1985. It is genuinely embarrassing that Answers in Genesis is still releasing videos about this as if it's some hot take. So when evolutionists invoke mutations as a key evolutionary mechanism, it's like saying that scrambling the information in a computer program could perhaps result in better software being written by random processes. Anyone who thinks that random changes to computer code can't make better software has never talked to an actual programmer. In my video about the argument from complexity, where I talked in great detail about how comparing DNA to a computer code is a really misleading and problematic thing for creationists to do, my comment section was full of people who are software engineers or computer programmers telling me about how complex code gets written by accident all the time! Like seriously, everybody that I've talked to with even a little bit of coding experience has told me stories about how they oopsed their way to success. I do not know why creationists are still using this talking point. So again, this is just boring, lazy thinking. It's like the old saying about how a tornado going through a junkyard can't build an airplane. It's just bringing up something completely ridiculous and so unrelated that we all just kind of forget what we're actually talking about. But in reality, corruption of DNA coding is a recipe for chaos. And the worse the corruption, the greater the problems. This is why we see so many serious diseases today as the direct result of genetic mutation. Ten bucks says they don't bring up mutation until the very end of the video, and then they just quickly dismiss it as something that causes genetic disorders. Because when you ignore all the things that prove you wrong, it's just so easy to be right. Evolutionists like to refer to the sort of variation we see among individual kinds of animals as microevolution, implying that this is somehow related to the chance formation of fundamentally new animals by the supposedly existing but never observed process known as macroevolution. 
However, there is no demonstrable experiment relating so-called microevolution and macroevolution, which makes these terms highly misleading. There is no demonstrable experiment relating you to your parents. Sure, we might see some physical or maybe even genetic similarities, but no one has actually observed them having sex and producing a child with your exact DNA. So for all we know, it never happened. In fact, there's no reason to believe it. Sorry, but as somebody who only believes observational science, I can only assume that you just erupted from the back of another human like the mighty Suriname Toad. Wiggly and horrifying. Seriously though, can you imagine if you use the exact same line of thinking that this guy is using right now on anything else? Like what if you were asked to judge a murder trial and you had the suspect's fingerprints on the murder weapon and you had footprints in the snow leading up to the house and you had a handwritten motive and you had an eyewitness who heard the guy say, I will now go kill this man. And you had a photograph of him going into the victim's house just before the time of death and coming out of the victim's house just after the time of death. And you said, you know what? I never actually saw him murder the guy. So as far as I'm concerned, this whole thing's just a matter of faith. I can't test or repeat the murder, and therefore, I can't prove anything about the murder. And because I personally believe that he's innocent, I can look at the evidence through my own personal lens and decide that it's all fake. The only difference between any two organisms, no matter what taxa, is their DNA. If I change the DNA, I change the organism. The only difference between microevolution and macroevolution is the amount of that change being made. It's the same change, just either a little bit of it or a lot of it. If I show you that I am able to walk five feet and then you later find that I have moved a mile, you don't have to wonder if I was propelled by magic. You can just assume that I did the five feet thing a whole bunch. Like this video is seriously 16 and a half minutes of this guy trying to convince everybody that two plus two equals four, but there's no reason to believe that two plus two plus two plus two plus two equals 10. Be honest, has anyone ever seen something even close to what would be properly termed evolution in this world? Listen careful now, because I'm not messing with you. Yes. The Bible on the other hand, makes perfect sense of what we observe in nature. And the donkey said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, which you have ridden all these years? Am I in the habit of doing this to you? No, said Balaam. Yeah, no, that seems legit. And in case you're wondering, here's a snippet from the kids section of AnswersInGenesis.org where they assure children that yes, that donkey really did talk. One thing that I'm probably going to cut out of this video because it's pretty long and redundant is that they keep referring back to the fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. In fact, there's a significant portion at the very beginning dedicated to retelling the story. And the general ideas that they're trying to convey with that are things like self-deception and fear of public scrutiny, with the argument being that the people who believe in evolution, just like the emperor, are too afraid of looking stupid to realize that they're actually acting stupidly. The obvious issue being that science is based in skepticism, not dogma. The whole purpose of science is to try to prove yourself wrong and only move forward with an idea so long as you can't do that. That's why we say you never accept a hypothesis, you fail to reject a hypothesis. So for them to try to draw this connection between a tale about self-deception and the most well-established theory in all of biology really speaks to their misunderstanding about how science works more than anything else. Like they might as well have just said, it's still just a theory. And honestly, Accusing anybody of deliberate self-deception and believing ridiculous things because you don't want to look foolish and then looking very foolish in the process is such a hilariously ironic thing for an organization like Answers in Genesis to do. Like, that coming from them, of all people, is so good. They believe in dragons and unicorns, and zombies, and giants, and talking snakes and donkeys because the Bible says that you're a fool if you don't believe those things. And they're here comparing you to the emperor from the fairy tale because you believe in evolution based on the evidence for evolution. It just, 
It, it doesn't get any funnier than that. <laughs> like, I can't get past the fact that they could have picked anything. They could have picked anything else. They could have picked any other fairy tale. They could have picked any other hook. They could have picked any other gimmick in the whole world for this video. And that's the one that they went with. And I just, I don't think that it can get any better than that. Like, name a funnier thing that they could have done. You can't. It's not out there. It's never been observed, so it's not real. <laughs> Overall, I give this video a science teacher challenge level 2 out of 10. If you listen to what this guy said, it's very obvious that he didn't actually say anything. All Answers in Genesis has done here is create a new John and Jane video with half the presenters and twice the stock footage. Seriously, go back and watch the Reacteria episode where John and Jane try to debunk natural selection. It's almost the exact same arguments in the exact same order. Like, I'm pretty sure I know where this guy learned his stuff. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts. Don't forget to go to Blinkist.com slash Labs. And start your seven day free trial. Have an awesome rest of your day and never stop learning. Bye-bye. So